Okay, this is a uh, paper which Jim and I have done, and it will be out this month in the uh, Manitoba Law Journal. And our interest was explicitly, is explicitly, in the reduction of poverty and in the reduction of uh, economic inequality. And we focused on the provincial level because that's the only place in Canada anything is happening. There's absolutely no momentum uh, at the federal level. And I'm going to try and uh, quickly present to you the guts of this paper, uh, and I'll do it uh, by presenting the following, why a basic income for Manitoba, why a gradualist approach? Because we make the argument here that there are already elements of a basic income in place and that our political strategy, as Jürgen might say, is to build on those basic elements rather than trying to start at the top with a large uh, basic income. What's our history in Canada and Manitoba with basic income? Jürgen's question, why now? And I think he would judge that we're... Uh, counting too much soft support and too much cheap support and maybe even some toxic support, but we'll look at it. Um, what's the current program architecture that can support this, uh, this evolution? What's the base upon which we're building, if you will? What's our proposal? How could it be financed? And what are the conditions for successfully implementing it? And I'll give a disclaimer at the beginning. We're, uh, we're talking about general design, uh, not the kind of design that Harvey has done where he has specifically costed out the parameters. That's our next step. Why a basic income for Manitoba? Well, to improve what's currently happening in poverty reduction and to yield uh, uh, more decreases, significant de decreases in income inequality. That's important for moral reasons, but it's important for a lot of reasons. It's a, a strategic target, as others have said, and Evelyn has shown, in terms of health status and costs, in terms of social cohesion. And even that leftist organization, the Conference Board of Canada, has said that poverty is no good for economic growth. And we agree. Here is a uh, diagram of the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of economic inequality. Uh, I draw your attention to the uh, scale on uh, the um, um, x-axis, so you can see we're talking about small changes. And this is Manitoba from 2000 to 2011. You can see a little volatility year to year, but not much change in the level of uh, income inequality in our population. Um, some say, isn't it wonderful, Manitoba is in about the middle of the country when it comes to income inequality. Jim and I say, we want to see some reductions in income inequality and current policy isn't doing it. Manitoba does have a poverty reduction strategy and this uh, table looks at the poverty rates in Canada and in Manitoba um, Manitoba is uh, on uh, the left, uh, Canada is on the right. Uh, we look at the change from 2008 to 2011. 2008 is the year before the All Aboard Poverty Reduction Strategy came into place. 2011 were the latest data we have available. Canada has no official poverty line, but on all three measures, the change in Manitoba is worse than the change in Canada. So on the market basket measure, poverty increased by 10.1% in Canada, but by 25% in Manitoba. On the after-tax low-income measure, poverty decreased by 4.5% in Canada, but increased by 3.7% in Manitoba. On the low-income cutoffs, a measure that uh, Evelyn and I think Harvey talked about, uh, poverty decreased by 5.4% in all of Canada and increased by 4.7% in Manitoba. So our conclusion is something's not working well in all aboard. We can have better poverty reduction and we think building towards a basic income is the answer. Why a gradualist approach? Well, full 
basic schemes don't attract much support, much real support. Uh, there have been successful pilots, not only the MINCOM, but the four U.S. successful pilots, one in Namibia, one in India. Uh, they have never moved to full-scale implementation. Uh, so we feel like, uh, uh, along with uh, some theorists, that a gradual and reversible approach based on the existing architecture will avoid at least some of the frontal opposition. Uh, now, Jürgen has mentioned some of the disbenefits of this, that uh, if you don't move universally to start with, you may not build uh, the support you need. Well, what's our history? Um, I hate to start with social credit in Alberta, but uh, I will. Uh, uh, Bible Bill Eberhardt uh, um, favored uh, an uh, annual payment to all Albertans, which he never was actually able to put into place. Um, but it is a nascent kind of basic income idea quite uh, long ago in our history. In 1968, the Economic Council of Canada rediscovered poverty in Canada and said that a guaranteed annual income should be uh, examined. Um, in 1971, the Kroll Commission, uh, the Special Senate Committee on Poverty, another rediscovery of poverty in Canada, recommended a, a guaranteed annual income, uh, but only at 70% of LICO and leaving out uh, young, uh, single, uh, non-disabled uh, people. Also in 1971, the castonguay nepfew uh, Commission in Quebec uh, made a recommendation for a basic income. In 1970, the Royal Commission on the Status of Women recommended a basic income for uh, single parent families headed by a young single parent. And the 1973 Social Security Review, uh, Federal Social Security Re Review, included uh, an element of basic income, but of course this never came to fruition. In 1974 to 79, we had the MINCOM uh, experiment in Manitoba. Uh, and honoring Jürgen and based on some writing by uh, Wayne Simpson and Derek Hum, it was framed not as a revolution in poverty reduction, but it was framed as an administrative experiment uh, that would be more administratively uh, efficient. Um, in 1982, uh, some toxic support occurred when the Royal Commission on the Economic Union and uh, Development Pros Prospects, headed by the late Donald MacDonald, recommended a very low guaranteed income and wanted to completely gut the Canadian welfare state uh, as it came into place. And uh, I think this does qualify uh, as an example of what Jürgen talked about as toxic income. In 2009, the Senate Subcommittee on Cities uh, made a limited recommendation about basic income. Uh, as I recall, they recommended that it be studied and that it be put into place for people with disabilities. And in 2010, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills, Social Development, and Status of Persons with Disabilities also made a recommendation that it be studied. So it's in the Canadian policy discourse for better or worse. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen anything since 2010 uh, when the Harper majority has changed the nature of that discourse. Why now? Well, uh, we're making uh, uh, the argument Jürgen doesn't want us to make, that there seems to be some rising support. Hugh Siegel has been a continuing advocate, former Senator Hugh Siegel, former Mulroney Chief of Staff, although he's not quite clear on whether this basic income would replace existing programs. The senior vice president and chief economist of the Conference Board of Canada has advocated a basic income. The Green Party of Canada, which may not have much capacity to implement it, has supported a basic income. And at the Federal Liberal Policy Convention, uh, two resolutions were passed in support of a basic income, but of course, um, 
political parties are uh, not bound by what is passed at policy conventions necessarily, and Mr. Trudeau hasn't mentioned uh, a basic income. Uh, Paul Dewar uh, in the 2012 NDP leadership campaign raised it. Uh, the leader of the uh, Prince Edward Island NDP has raised it. Brian Pallister has said it should be considered, but the two other Manitoba political parties have not said so. And there is a whole bunch of evidence, as Jurgen told you, of increasing media interest. Uh, now, Jurgen's raised an interesting question about how uh, we decide uh, whether we should be doing something now. Uh, Jim and I didn't anticipate the NDP leadership convention, but we did anticipate a provincial election and thought that given Pallister's mention, it might be a good window of opportunity to at least have this discussed in the uh, provincial election. So what are the nascent mechanisms that we have in place if we already have some uh, elements of uh, uh, a basic income in place. So just uh, to mention uh, what exists federally, and you're all aware of, the old age security demigrant, which is taxed back uh, with a special levy and the guaranteed income supplement, the Canadian Child Tax Benefit and the National Children's Benefit Supplement, probably the purest example of a negative income tax uh, model, the universal uh, child care benefit, a demigrant, but a taxable demigrant, which child care adv advocates will tell you has nothing to do with child care, um, and the child disability a benefit, uh, a, a demigrant, uh, a non-taxable demigrant for uh, families with children with disability. Uh, the working income uh, tax benefit uh, and the GST HST tax uh, credit. So we have some mechanisms federally. This is what we think we have provincially, the education proper property tax credit. Um, and I, uh, we don't have time to give much details about these programs. Uh, which goes to uh, property taxpayers or renters as a tax credit. 55 plus, which goes to low-income recipients of uh, federal OAS and low-income persons 55 and older not eligible for o OAS. It's an income-tested supplement. The Manitoba Child Benefit, which I think Harvey mentioned, low-income recipients of the Canadian Child Tax Benefit. Um, and it is also an income-tested supplement. The Manitoba prenatal benefit, low-income pregnant women 14 weeks uh, until the outcome of the pregnancy. It's an income-tested supplement. The interesting thing about it is that it can be collected by uh, women living in First Nations communities and women who are social assistance recipients, which is not the case with these other benefits. And so we think there's a kind of a base and one approach is to try and build on that base. So in general terms, here how, here's how we would try and build on it. We would increase 55 plus in several iterations to the low income measure threshold and then liberalize the needs test as we did that. So we would start with 55 plus because uh, seniors vote in large numbers. Uh, and uh, it's good to, to start with a constituency that has political power. Um, most Canadians, most Manitobans, most in Western societies are positive towards benefits for uh, seniors uh, when they aren't towards benefits for some other age groups. Um, and uh, there are fewer difficult issues around work effort and so on and so forth. Uh, in step two, we, we would set, take a similar approach to the Manitoba Children's Benefit. That's the demographic group with the highest poverty rate in Manitoba, and Manitoba's uh, child poverty rates are the highest of any province in the country. So it's an important group to move to. It's uh, a group that is seen as deserving by most of the public. Three, 
Uh, we'd start by removing working age adults with disabilities from employment and income assistance and establish a program like 55 plus for them. Uh, so again, moving forward slowly, gradually, trying to avoid frontal opposition. We're dealing with a group that's seen as deserving uh, the disabled. And there have been many recommendations from the Caledon Institute to have a separate, uh, for example, from the Caledon Institute to have a separate program for the disabled. And several provinces, uh, Alberta for some time, Saskatchewan, uh, have actually established separate, separate programs. And finally, the big step, uh, eliminating the most politically difficult program to eliminate employment and income assistance, which many of you know is welfare, by extending the junior component of 55 plus to all non-disabled adults. And the logic of the approach is by then we would have demonstrated that a basic income is not a scary thing. Um, not everyone quits work. All these terrible effects don't occur and some positive effects do occur. And step five would move to establishing a universal basic income. It's easy to put it on paper in these terms, but difficult to do. You, we could start by amalgamating the programs we've just talked about in steps one to four, and then we could move towards universalizing eligibility. Um, there would be some advantages that Harvey talked about to a negative income tax model, lower administrative uh, costs, for example. Uh, lower initial outlays by government, which is uh, important. Uh, but of course, such a model would require the cooperation of the, uh, of the federal government. So I've kind of taken you, because of the time constraints, on a quick tour of this. How would this be paid for? Uh, and we haven't costed this out specifically. We uh, intend to do so. Uh, existing resources dedicated to current income support programs, uh, of course, would be would continue to be available. Uh, there would be administrative efficiencies, principally from downsizing and eliminating employment and income assistance. And Harvey talked about the high level of uh, the proportion of cost in that program, that is administrative cost. We think a dedicated tax or levy should be avoided at all costs because that gives those who don't benefit or don't see themselves as benefiting and oppose a basic income a good target to shoot at and to keep shooting at. And we had an interesting idea based a bit on the Alaska model that uh, Jurgen mentioned. Now in that model, Alaska views the uh, oil and gas that is uh, uh, yield in a, yielded in Alaska as owned by all Alaskans. And from oil and gas royalties principally, they have established a permanent fund which among other things pays an annual dividend. So I'm not saying it's a full implementation of a basic income, but it's something. Well, in Manitoba, we're lucky. We wouldn't need those complications. We have uh, Manitoba Hydro, a public utility. The citizens of Manitoba own Manitoba Hydro, and financing a basic income might be a good way for that ownership to be expressed. And, and uh, Manitoba Hydro has high, what they call retained earnings. I'll have to consult an economist uh, about the difference between that and profit but they have high retained earnings. They do have infrastructure to replace, but they also provide cheap power to many of us, which environmentalists don't think is a good thing, and maybe it isn't. They provide cheap power to non-Manitobans also and to corporations, and that pricing structure might be redesigned to provide at least part of the revenue that could be used to finance a basic income. Well, what's, this, is one of the this is one of the flies in the ointment, but a considerable fly. Uh, 
the federal government until about 1994 used uh, a good things the, the courts had conferred on them or agreed they had, the federal spending power. And it was really used to grow the Canadian welfare state. Without it, province and territories could not have done nearly what they were going to do since uh, 1994, since the Chrétien decision to end the Canada Assistance Plan and establish block, block grants. That hasn't been the case. So there's a financing problem that Manitoba and other provinces uh, possess. The other part of this uh, problem is that if the province is going to do it with its own revenues on its own hook, there's a perverse incentive for the federal government uh, not to do new things because that doesn't seem to be on the agenda of the current federal government, but to even constrain what they had planned to do because why not become a free rider on the province or I, I should say why not continue to become a free rider on the provinces. So that's a considerable fly in the ointment, but fortunately flies don't live forever. <laughs> now, uh, what are, uh, no, no, we'll do it at the ballot box, not with a fly swatter. Um, well, what are some of the conditions that have to be in place for this to work, this gradualist approach? And there, there are some negatives, uh, if we have time we can talk about. But these gradual changes have to be of sufficient size so that there are measurable effects in the short to midterm, because that's how the strategy works. You take away the fear and opposition by doing it and showing the effects. And there have to be uh, sufficient changes for those effects to be measurable. There has to be a sophisticated evaluation design because we are not likely to see population-wide uh, effects. And it's lucky Rob is here. He can start designing it uh, as we uh, have coffee. Um, and it can't simply look at uh, costs. It has to look at the difficult question of the economic value, value of health. Not just savings in health care, but health itself Life itself has an economic value. Education has an economic value, and of course, uh, employment has an economic value. So we would uh, need uh, strong theoretical economists, economists to make sure that we were accounting for this, because the costs are very easy to account for. The economic value of the effects of the benefits is, is a little harder. We argue uh, for this uh, basic income to be able to do what it should do, we continue to need adequate public services. So we're only going to be to see improvements in employment if there's enough, enough child care for parents to be able to put their children in child care. We're only going to see educational improvements if there is support uh, for post, uh, for, uh, uh, beneficiaries to attend post-secondary education, and so on. Um, we don't want uh, there to be decreases in preventive health services because that may blunt some of the effects, that kind of things. We need to maintain income-tested sub subsidies for variable needs like medication needs, legal services, so on. It's clear to us you shouldn't get rid of those programs uh, uh, and save them. And you'd have to maintain a small last resort, hopefully more humane residual welfare program because there are abrupt changes in income. There are emergencies that occur and it's the poor who don't have the margin to deal with those. Um, so thank you very much. So generally, we've thought of this as proceeding in that kind of stepwise fashion. There might be overlapping steps. So, uh, so there would have to be a, um, 
a real assessment. I'm sorry. So there would have to be a real assessment as to how much the political climate is changing. But the logic is we start where it's safe with seniors who have uh, the combined benefit of both being seen in positive terms and actually being a political constituency which stands up for itself at the ballot box and other places. And to start to move with them um, and uh, when it's safe to move as quickly uh, getting them up to the poverty threshold uh, and at some point then beginning with children. So of course I, I don't think it would make sense to lay it out in detail beforehand. There would have to be a good way to sense uh, what champions there were among political decision makers and where they were at what champions there are in the bureaucracy and what the public mood seems to be. So it would have to be accompanied by a smart political strategy for sure. Uh, how do you see labor supply expanding? Yes, but these, uh, I, I mean, administration of, for example, uh, employment and income assistance is large, but I don't think large enough to have a general effect in the labor market. The first point you raise, I think, is a very good point, and it's part of a more general issue that if you introduce this population by population, you're minimizing uh, the number of winners, uh, and you may be minimizing your support, and you're right, some populations that receive it uh, may not want to see it expanded. Uh, now, I like to think that there are many seniors that will be concerned uh, about children in the population, some of whom will be their grandchildren. Um, and I think maybe, uh, maybe Jurgen's shaming strategy might uh, work there. We might have a strategy around uh, selfish seniors. <laughs> Just kidding, but, but I, you're right, I think uh, the gradualist approach has that concern and many others. One of the other concerns is that if this is stretched out for many years, lots of changes can occur in politics and in the environment over those years. Uh, MINCOM didn't even make it to its planned end. I think not because of anything in the experiment, but because of changes at the federal level and then changes in federal provincial relations. So lots of risks and we're not trying to paint this as risk free. Uh, risk free doesn't occur on earth, only in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> okay, once again, thanks to both our presentations, our presenters will have to move on.